Hello everyone and welcome to Math 220A Mathematical Logic Lecture 2. Let me remind briefly uh, what we have covered in the previous lecture. We have defined first order languages, we have defined terms and have discussed unique readability for terms and we have discussed uh, and defined formulas both uh, the atomic formulas, the simplest ones, and uh, the general formulas. The, all of this was on the syntactic side. And we also have defined uh, structures. And we have defined uh, the interpretations of the logical uh, symbols in a language in a structure. These two notions uh, are on the semantic side, so they establish uh, the beginnings of the rela relation between uh, syntax and semantics. Today we con will continue discussing formulas, uh, introducing some further notation and some of their properties, and then we will begin talking about interpretations of formulas in structures, uh, expanding on the discussion of the semantics so far. Uh, so we will begin with the following proposition, which is an analog uh, of unique readability for terms, uh, but generalized to formulas. So unique reading of formulas. We have any L formula phi satisfies one and only one of the following possibilities. The first case, phi, is an atomic formula. The second possibility, phi, is equal to not psi or the negation psi for some unique L formula psi. The third possibility phi is equal to the word the bracket symbol psi con the conjunction symbol chi, the bracket symbol, for some unique L formulas, psi and chi. And the last possibility is that phi is equal to the word, the existential symbol, the symbol x, and uh, the word psi for some unique variable symbol x and some unique L formula psi. Again, we will leave the proof of this proposition as an exercise. Uh, but the hint here is that uh, one first proves by induction on the length of formulas that no proper initial segment of a formula is a formula.
if uh, phi is a formula we define its height height phi as the least natural number k such that phi belongs to the set fml lk uh, which i remind you uh, from the previous lecture is uh, the set of all formulas which can be obtained in k steps starting with the atomic ones and applying one of the three syntactic rules for constructing new formulas it follows from the unique reading of formulas that the height of the formula given by bracket phi conjunction psi bracket is equal to 1 plus the maximum of the heights of the formula phi and the formula psi and also that the height of the formula uh, of the form exist x phi is given uh, is the same as the height of the formula negation phi and is equal to 1 plus height of phi. Uh, these two observations again will allow us to give uh, definitions but, uh, and various proofs by induction on the height of formulas, thanks to the unique readability uh, result. Next, we will define uh, free and also bound occurrences of variables in formulas. First, let vk be a variable, so just an element of the set of variables of a given language. Uh, in fact, uh, it's the same set for all languages. This is the common logical part, the variables. Uh, then one defines by induction on the height of a formula phi the notion of a free occurrence of the variable vk in the formula phi the inductive definition is as follows First, uh, the base case, so if phi is atomic, recall that it means that phi is of the form T1 is equal to T2, so uh, the word T1 followed by the symbol equality, followed by the term T2 for some uh, terms or L terms T1, T2. So, if phi is atomic, then all occurrences of uh, vk in phi are free. And let, let me be uh, completely clear what we mean by an occurrence. So, vk is just a symbol uh, in the alphabet, and every formula is a word in that alphabet, so the symbol might appear in the word uh, corresponding to the formula in various places uh, and so we define certain uh, subset of the places where it might occur uh, to be free so for atomic formulas uh, it's all of them no matter where it appears in the formula it is free next if phi is uh, of the form the negation psi, uh, then the free occurrences 
of vk in phi are uh, those that are free in psi. So the set of free occurrences of this variable uh, vk is uh, the same as in psi. Next, if phi is equal to the formula uh, of the form bracket, psi conjunction chi bracket, then the free occurrences of the variable vk in phi are those that uh, are free in psi and those uh, that are free in chi. Next, if phi is equal to the formula exists, the symbol exists, vl psi for some variable vl and uh, some formula psi and we also have that L is not equal to K, then the free occurrences of VK in phi are exactly those that are free in psi. And Finally, if phi is equal to the formula exists vk psi, so the same variable vk uh, now comes after the existential quantifier uh, in phi, then no occurrence of vk in phi is free. Note that this uh, list of possibilities for the formula phi exhausts uh, all, uh, all of the possibilities uh, by the earlier uh, remark, the unique readability of formulas. We know that every formula is one of these forms. Uh, and so by induction on the uh, height of a formula, we have defined uh, the meaning of a free occurrence of a variable vk in, in the formula phi. Okay, so second, occurrences of uh, the variable vk in the formula phi, which are not free, are called bound 3. The free variables of uh, a formula phi are those having at least one free occurrence in phi. And uh, we denote by free of phi the set of uh, the free variables of phi. And finally, a sentence is a formula with no free variables. As you can see from this definition, we have uh, defined the meaning of a free occurrence of a variable of a formula uh, purely syntactically, uh, just as a procedure, uh, as a set of a certain set of words uh, according to these uh, inductive rules. Uh, what we are trying to capture here, however, is the uh, intuition, uh, to give formal meaning to the intuition that in a formula, 
some of the variables might uh, be quantified uh, and some are not. But of course, uh, since the formula can be quite involved, um, it might be hard to tell if uh, the formula actually falls under the scope of a quantifier uh, or it doesn't. Uh, so this provides a formal uh, inductive definition for this. Uh, now let's uh, consider a quick example. Assume that phi is the formula bracket exists v0, v0 less than v1, and v0 is equal to v1. Then we have the first two occurrences of v0 abound. The third is free. All occurrences of V1 in Phi are free. Thus, we have that uh, the set of the free variables of Phi consists of V0, V1. Next, we introduce some uh, additional notation. We will use the following abbreviations. We will write bracket phi disjunction psi as a shorthand for the formula negation, negation phi conjunction, the negation psi, and we refer to this formula as the disjunction of phi and psi. We will write phi implies psi in brackets as an abbreviation for the formula not phi and not psi and refer to it as the implication between phi and psi. We will also write phi two-sided arrow psi as an abbreviation for the formula phi implies psi conjunction psi implies phi and refer to it as the equivalence and we will also write for all x phi as an abbreviation for the negation exists x negation phi and refer to it as the universal quantification Let me stress that uh, we are not introducing any new symbols uh, in the meaning of uh, formulas and the formation rules for the formulas. We are simply, uh, for the convenience of writing, uh, introducing some abbreviations. So the actual formula is going to be the formula on the right-hand side, uh, but we will write uh, the, the corresponding abbreviation on the left. Uh, of course, you might have seen some other um, in other presentations of first-order logic, some of these operations on the left, disjunction, uh, implication, equivalence, or universal quantifier, are introduced from the beginning uh, as a part of the syntactic rules for forming new formulas. But here we uh, stick to, to the minimal set of operations, uh, which are sufficient uh, to gain the full power of first-order logic. So we only have the existential quantifiers in the language, uh, and we have negations and conjunctions and nothing else. So, but later on we will see that it's uh, 
we don't lose any expressibility power uh, due to that. But what we gain is the simplicity of proving various results about uh, the properties of uh, uh, our first order logic. We will also write exists x1 comma dot dot, dot uh, comma xn instead of exists x in 1, etc., exists x in n, and similarly for the universal quantifier, so this is just to avoid uh, repeating the same symbol many times, but of course the actual formula uh, that is abbreviated in this way is the one on the right, this one. Uh, we will also write r of t1 tn instead of R T1 Tn and sometimes we might also write T1 R T2 instead of R T1 T2 when R is a binary relation we will also write the conjunction phi 0, conjunction etc, conjunction phi n, or sometimes the big conjunction with indices varying from 0 to n of phi i instead of the following uh, actual formula. So we have phi 0 conjunction phi 1. This is applying the corresponding rule for forming new formulas from the old ones once. Now this itself is a new formula, so we can take the formula conjuncting it with phi 2. This gives us a new formula. Uh, and then we can uh, iterate this process by repeatedly taking uh, the conjunction operation for fi forming new formulas. Uh, n times, uh, which gives us uh, a new formula, and uh, we will also you apply similar abbreviations for disjunctions instead of conjunctions. So all of these are uh, abbreviations which will allow us to save some time writing out various uh, complicated formulas. And finally, to make uh, the reading of the formulas uh, close to the na natural language or to the usual habitual mathematical language, uh, we will also sometimes uh, add parentheses or omit them in a way which uh, is not following the uh, formal rules for uh, uh, formulas that we defined and discussed uh, earlier, but uh, helps us uh, understand the intended meaning and usually uh, it's not hard to recover the actual uh, formula from it. Uh, so in this case, when we manipulate the brackets um, in the abbreviation, we will read the formulas according to the convention that uh, the symbols from the set negation, existential quantifier, universal quantifier, bind strongest, followed by the conjunction, then the disjunction, and then the symbols from the set implication equivalence, which bind the weakest. Let's consider an example. If we write for all x phi conjunction psi implies chi, uh, so according to the rules uh, that we just outlined, uh, this formula shall mean the formula 
for all x phi conjunction pa psi implies chi which uh, let's remember if we unwind all the abbreviations is actually the formula for all x phi and psi conjunction the negation of chi negated and so finally since we still have the universal quantifier here which is not part of the language uh, this is actually the formula the negation of the formula formed by the negation exists x negation phi conjunction psi conjunction negation chi having discussed uh, the syntactic rules for forming formulas uh, and some notation related to their basic properties our next task is to define the semantics of formulas uh, and terms or in other words how to interpret them in a, in a given first order structure towards this purpose we make the following definition let a be an L structure in some given first order language L then an assignment with values in the structure A is a function alpha from the set of the variables V to the base set A of the structure curly A and 2 if alpha is an assignment and t is an L term we define t uh, superscript curly A the structure evaluated on alpha so this is the interpretation of the term on a given assignment uh, we define it by induction on the height of the term t as follows if we are given a variable vi uh, which remember is in particular a term then its interpretation on the assignment alpha is defined to be the value of the function alpha on this variable vi so this is the definition for any variable vi in the set of all variables v and we also define the interpretation of the term given by constant symbol c on an assignment alpha to be simply the value uh, or the interpretation of this constant symbol in the structure a so this uh, for a constant symbol c in the language l and then inductively we know that uh, every term is either of this form so it's either a variable or a constant or it is of the form f t1 through tn for some terms t1 tn uh, of smaller height hence uh, by the inductive assumptions uh, we already defined the assignment of these terms of smaller height so in order to define the interpretation of this term on an assignment alpha we let it be the value of the function given by the interpretation 
of the function symbol f in the structure a, so it is a function of variety n, and we evaluate it on the tuple given by the interpretations of the terms t1 on alpha, etc., and tn on alpha, which uh, I repeat are all terms of smaller height, so the uh, the interpretations on alpha already defined by the inductive assumption. So uh, now, by unique readability, each term of, is a, of one of these forms, so it gives us uh, uh, a good definition of uh, an evaluation of a term on an assignment. The next lemma follows directly from the definition. If two assignments alpha and beta coincide on all variables occurring in T, then the interpretation of T on alpha is equal to the interpretation of T on beta. So the idea here is that uh, the term uh, can be viewed as a function from a certain power of the base set of the structure into uh, a certain other power of the base set of the structure, uh, where uh, this function is defined according to the choice uh, of an assignment. So once we uh, basically we're trying to plug some elements from the structure into into some of the variables of a term uh, and uh, this definition makes it uh, uh, this idea formal. So next we will discuss some notation which stresses this uh, parallel with uh, functions in an even stronger form. So if t is a term we might denote it by t of x1 through xn if the variables xi are all distinct and all variables having at least one occurrence in T all belong to the set X1 through Xn. Then, if we are given a term T of X1 through Xn and a tuple of elements A1 through An of the corresponding lengths from the base set of the structure, then we define the interpretation of the term on this tuple, so T square brackets A1 through AN, by taking the interpretation of the term on the assignment alpha with alpha defined to be so that uh, the value of alpha on xi is ai for all i uh, and this is well defined in view of the previous lemma because we can define it in an arbitrary way, the assignment alpha in an arbitrary way, on the variables uh, outside of the set x1 through xn, but uh, that part of the assignment is, uh, doesn't matter for the interpretation of the term on this assignment or the evaluation of the term on this assignment uh, by the lemma above. 
So this stresses uh, that uh, term can be viewed as a function in several variables. Uh, and this notation makes it closer, uh, in this case, to the standard notation for uh, functions evaluated on certain uh, elements in the domain. Finally, we define the meaning of a satisfaction of a formula in a structure. Uh, which is also known as Tarski's definition of truth. Let A be an L structure by induction on the height of a formula phi we define the relation A satisfies phi alpha uh, where alpha is an arbitrary assignment and uh, so like I said this uh, relation is read as phi is satisfied in A by alpha or on alpha uh, so we define it inductively as follows A satisfies T1 is equal to T2 on alpha by definition is satisfied if and only if the value of the term t1 on the assignment alpha is equal to the value of the term t2 on the assignment alpha. Next, A satisfies the formula R t1, etc. tn on alpha. Uh, if and only if we have that the tuple of elements of the base set of A given by evaluating the term T1 on alpha, etc. Uh, Tn on alpha. So this gives us a tuple of elements uh, of uh, A of length n uh, belongs to uh, the set given by interpreting the symbol R in A. Next uh, we define that A satisfies the negation of the formula Psi on alpha. Uh, so more precisely the formula given by negation Psi on alpha. If and only if A does not satisfy the formula Psi on alpha. That is not A satisfies Psi of alpha. Next, the A satisfies the formula Psi and Chi on alpha if and only if A satisfies Psi of alpha and also A satisfies Chi of alpha and lastly we define A satisfies exists X Psi on alpha if and only if there exists some element A in the base set of the structure so that A satisfies Psi on the assignment uh, which we denote as alpha a slash x so 
this is an assignment uh, defined in terms of a new assignment defined in terms of alpha so more precisely the assignment alpha a slash x denotes the assignment defined by alpha a x on the variable x is equal to a so no matter what uh, assignment alpha assigned to the variable x the new assignment uh, assigns a to it and on all other variables the new assignment gives uh, the same uh, as a result as a function from variables to the elements as the original assignment alpha so for all y different from x so the new assignment where we uh, replace uh, we make sure that it assigns uh, a to x and does the same thing as alpha on all of the other variables first of all note that uh, thanks to the unique readability of formulas uh, this is a uh, relation of satisfaction is now well defined according to this rule we have covered all the cases of forming uh, new formulas of uh, bigger height from the smaller height ones now of course uh, the definition essentially gives the intended meaning for the symbols uh, for the syntactic uh, expressions uh, that formulas represent uh, that's how the originally the syntax was chosen uh, so that uh, the symbols like negation, conjunction, existential quantifier, etc. are all invocative of the, int the intended meaning. Uh, so now we define it uh, formally uh, according, to, according to this intuition. First we have the following proposition. If two assignments alpha and beta coincide on the free variables of a formula phi then one has that a satisfies phi on the assignment alpha if and only if a satisfies phi on the assignment beta this proposition, of course, justifies uh, the desired property that uh, the truth value of a formula in a given assignment should only depend on the free variables of its formula. Okay, proof. We argue by induction on the height of the formula phi uh, following the definition, the case of atomic formulas follows from the earlier lemma about terms so we have earlier already observed that uh, the um, value of a term on a given assignment only depends on its free variables and uh, for the atomic formula, it's just the equality of uh, the values of two terms, which uh, then uh, holds as well. For the inductive step, we'll only consider the case where the formula phi is equal to the formula exists x psi all the other cases are uh, uh, being easy so if we have that a satisfies phi on an assignment alpha by definition this means that there exists some element a in the base set of the model 
of the structure such that um, the structure satisfies psi on the assignment alpha a replacing x. So the assignment ob obtained by inf uh, uh, sending the variable x to a and everything else uh, keeping it the same as an alpha. Now any variable y different from x that is free in psi is also free in phi by definition of the free occurrences of the variables. Hence we have that A satisfies psi beta A x. Indeed we are assuming that the two assignments agree on all of the free variables, uh, hence on all y different from x, and uh, they also, the, these two assignments, alpha uh, a slash x and beta a slash x also agree on x as well, by definition. They both go to a from x. Uh, and so, by the induction hypothesis, and the definition of satisfaction for existential formulas, we also have that a satisfies phi of beta. We introduce one final bit of notation. A formula phi will be denoted by phi of x1 xn if the variables xi are all distinct and all free variables in phi belong in this list. So belong the set x1 through xn. Now, if a formula phi of x1 through xn and elements a1 through an in the base set of the structure a are given, We define A satisfies phi evaluated on these elements A1 through An by uh, saying that A satisfies phi on an assignment alpha where alpha is an assignment such that alpha of xi is equal to ai. Again, this is uh, well defined uh, by the previous proposition since uh, the truth value uh, of the satisfaction of a formula in a structure on a given assignment only depends on what this assignment uh, does to the free variables of a formula. And so uh, this notation is uh, well defined. Thus, uh, the formula phi of x1 xn defines an Enary relation on the uh, underlying base set of a structure A 
given by the set of all n tuples a1 through a n in a to the n so that a satisfies phi on a1 through a n Relations uh, of this form are called definable in a structure A. Uh, and in particular, when phi is a sentence, which remember simply means a formula without any free variables, then the relation A satisfies phi can be interpreted as phi is satisfied or holds or true in the structure A. One also refers to it sometimes as A is a model of phi. This concludes today's lecture. Next time we will see some examples uh, for satisfaction and we will discuss substitution for formulas. Thank you for listening and I'll see you next time.